Whether it's checking out at the grocery store or waiting for an elevator, we all experience queues regularly, and we've all thought there's got to be a better way to do this. My name is Muriji Fatunde. I'm a scientist working in the field of operations management or the study of how companies deliver products and services. One branch of our field is queuing theory, the mathematical study of waiting in line. It turns out there are many ways to do it better. To show you some of them, let's go to a familiar setting with a whole lot of cues. The airport. You and a friend arrive at the check-in desk. This is the first queue standing between you and your summer holiday. There are two versions of this simple queue. One with a separate line for each ticket agent, with passengers choosing a line upon arrival. And another where everyone joins a combined queue and the next passenger goes to the next available agent. Let's assume passengers can't switch lines after joining. Which side do you choose? It's an interesting question. All agents work equally fast on average, and both sides have identical capacity and receive new passengers at the same rate. Shouldn't you expect the same weight in either line? Let's send one of you through each line and see what happens. The average waiting time for customers in your line was three minutes, while it was less than a minute on your friend's side. The side with agents serving a shared line, what queuing theorists call a pooled queue, was 76% faster than the side with dedicated agents working in parallel. Was that just a coincidence? If you played this scenario out 1,000 times, the pooled queues would converge on being 76% faster than the parallel queues. Why is this? In a parallel queue, if one traveler takes an unusually long time to serve, everyone behind them is simply stuck. In a pooled queue, the customers caught behind this slow traveler can be served by one of the remaining agents. Even without these slow outliers, parallel queues make it possible to be held up in one queue while another agent is free, wasting agent capacity. Of course, the details depend on the properties of the queue, including variability in arrival and processing times and the amount of slack in the system. But in general, pooled queues allow us to reduce average wait times due to economies of scale. Even better, they save you from feeling that whichever line you're in is moving slowest. Now that you've checked in, you're desperate for a cup of coffee. At a cafe by your gate, an electronic screen lets you order, coffee or sandwich. You hurriedly tap coffee and watch the lone, frazzled employee at work. There are four customers ahead of you, two coffee drinkers and two sandwich eaters. You realize it takes an average of one minute to make each coffee and an average of five minutes to make each sandwich. All you wanted was a coffee and you ended up waiting 13 minutes. Outrageous. You blurt out, the coffees are so quick. If they just let the coffee drinkers skip the line, we'd be finished almost immediately and the sandwich eaters would hardly notice. Your friend looks unconvinced. Let's do an experiment. Instead of giving all customers equal priority, whenever someone wants coffee, the barista will pause and serve them first. You were right. On average, the coffee customers waited just over a minute. However, there's a trade-off. With priority service for faster customers, we significantly increase the wait for slower customers. Let's try something less extreme. If instead, we let coffee drinkers jump to the front of the queue, but never interrupt work on a sandwich, we can still decrease wait time for coffee, but with a smaller impact on sandwiches. While this could be a good compromise, some sandwich customers may be unhappy. Some may even abandon the queue and board their flights hungry. We could come up with other service rules that give faster orders some priority, but not infinite priority, over slow ones, or assign dedicated resources to them. One common example is the express lane at supermarkets. Supermarkets often reserve some lines for faster customers, but most checkouts serve customers in the order they arrived. In general, queue designers have to balance multiple considerations when designing queues. Some options might improve performance measures such as average wait times, but at the expense of important values such as fairness. Coffee in hand and with a couple of hours left before takeoff, you settle in at the gate. Suddenly, it hits you. Ticket sales for Beyonce's latest tour open today. When people queue up for a scarce resource, 
some interesting things happen. Let's pretend the queue for Beyonce's tickets is as simple as can be. People queue in a single line for a limited number of tickets. You show up two hours before the ticket booth opens. But once the line starts moving, today's batch sells out long before you reach the line. The next day, you try again. This time, you decide to arrive 10 hours early. The problem is, so did everyone else. Let's try one more time. This time, you arrive 36 hours in advance and you get a ticket. But was it worth it? Queuing is tricky when it involves an exclusive good. Sadly, not everyone is eventually guaranteed service, even if they're patient enough to wait. In theory, people will wait until the cost of their time in line is equal to the value they place on seeing Beyonce. In this case, tickets were sold on a first-come, first-served basis. In queuing theory, we call this first-in, first-out. While this system somewhat increases the chance that the most devoted fans will end up getting tickets, it discriminates against people who are not able to give up all that time, and it eats into the benefit even for the winners. There are ways to address this by changing the policy or discipline of the queue. For example, another option is a lottery. Now, there are also downsides to a lottery. For example, your chance of getting tickets is unrelated to how much you value them. Some performers combine lotteries with other elements. For example, a ticket presale that is only advertised in a private email list, or a lottery only among fans who have waited a certain amount. At the end of the day, if a queue exists, it's because there's a limited resource that needs to be distributed. So some people will likely have to pay, in time or money, to get a desirable outcome. Queue designers do their best, but it's hard to make everyone happy. Twelve hours later, you arrive at your destination. Your only desires in life are a warm shower and a nap. But first, you have to clear immigration. You look up and see two separate queues, one for domestic and one for foreign passengers. You head to the foreign queue and your friend heads to domestic, complaining that it's twice as long. There are two key concepts at play here, service rates and arrival rate. If the rate at which people are being served is slower than the arrival rate, the length of the queue can continue to grow indefinitely, with each new arrival waiting longer than the one before. This situation doesn't typically get out of hand in an airport. While immigration lines can be painfully slow, they eventually clear. But it does actually happen in another immigration setting. The US has quotas in place for the number of green card recipients available each year for people from certain countries, which effectively caps the service rate available. When the arrival rate of applicants from a country is higher than that cap, the queue gets longer and longer. Last year, the estimated wait time for some new Indian green card applicants hit 134 years. Another way of saying, forever. Luckily, you and your friend made it through in reasonable time. Let's hope those are the last cues you'll see for quite a while. <laughs>